So around uh, 1998, my buddies at the Jet Propulsion Lab and I got to thinking, you know, what could we do to improve the state of communications for space exploration? Because we'd been using point-to-point -point radio links uh, to communicate with spacecraft for about uh, the last 40 years or so after we had started launching things at Venus and Mars and so on. So Mars was a major focus of attention. Lots of missions went there. Some didn't make it. Some uh, survived. And we began thinking about whether we could use a richer networking architecture than a point-to-point -point radio link to communicate in space. And I thought, well, you know, TCPIP seems to work okay on Earth. You know, maybe it'll work okay on Mars. So we, uh, we said, well, that ought to be okay. And it should work okay in the spacecraft because that's a very low delay environment. But it doesn't work on an interplanetary basis. There are a couple of problems. Problem number one, the speed of light is too slow. Uh, between Earth and Mars, when we're you know, uh, nearest uh, to each other in our orbit, it's about 35 million miles. When we're farthest apart, it's 235 million miles. So that's between 7 and 40 minutes round trip time. TCP doesn't do well with a 40 minute round trip time. The flow control doesn't work. There are a whole bunch of other problems. Then there's this other little problem called um, celestial motion. The planets are rotating. We haven't figured out how to stop that. So uh, the, the problem here is that uh, if you're trying to talk to something on the surface of a planet and the planet's rotating, eventually you can't talk to it because it's on the wrong side of the planet. So you have both variable delay and disruption. So we said, okay, the only solution to this is to invent a new suite of protocols that have the capability of dealing with the delay and, and the disruption. So we call these DTN, for Delay and Disruption Tolerant Protocols, and we developed a, a set of them and did some experimentation and got these things working after several iterations so far just on planet Earth. Now, those of you who are uh, fans of uh, space exploration will remember that the rovers landed on Mars in 2004 in January. They're originally, uh, they were originally intended to transmit information straight back to Earth uh, from the surface of Mars to the deep space network, which has three 70-meter dishes in three locations around the world at 28.5 kilobits a second. Of course, the scientists weren't too happy about that because 28.5 kilobits a second is really slow. Uh, but that was the way it was. Now, they turned the radios on, and they overheated. So the first reaction to that is, uh-oh, better reduce the duty cycle on the radios to keep them from destroying themselves or other equipment on board the spacecraft, which made the scientists even more pissed off. So then somebody noticed that there was an X-band radio on board the rover, and that there was a similar X-band radio available on the orbiters that had been originally sent there to map the surface of Mars to figure out where the rover should go. But they had finished that mission, and they could be reprogrammed. So the engineers reprogrammed both the rover and the orbiters to, um, to accept data from the rover on that little X-band radio, which happened to run at 128 kilobits a second, and then hold on to the data in the orbiter as it was coming around until it got to the right place to transmit data back to the deep space network at 128 kilobits a second because it was outside of Mars' atmosphere and it had a bigger solar panel. So we actually got four times more data by going store and forward, which, by the way, is how the Internet works. That's how packet switching works. So this store and forward idea looked pretty good, although um, it hadn't been anticipated. When the Phoenix lander was sent to the North Pole of Mars in May of 2008, there was no configuration that would allow it to transmit data straight back to Earth, so they used the same store and forward technique in order to uh, get all the data back uh, from the... Uh, <coughs> from the lander, uh, uh, the Phoenix lander on the North Pole. So what we're hoping to do at this point is to standardize these new DTN-style protocols. We're working with the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which has uh, members all the uh, spacefaring countries around the world. If they adopt these protocols and they uh, use them in their spacecraft, then all of the spacecraft can be interoperable. And even if they don't use these protocols for their primary scientific missions, after they've completed the mission, if the spacecraft is still operational, we could actually use it to become a node of an interplanetary backbone. We'd literally repurpose the, uh, the spacecraft, which is what we did with the orbiters that have been uh, doing surveying work. They now became uh, communication relays. So the idea here is that we will be able to develop a set of protocols that can be used for space exploration, both for manned and robotic uh, systems. Now, we have these things 
operating on board the International Space Station. We have the protocols operating on board the epoxy spacecraft that just rendezvoused with a comet to Hartley 2 last November. Uh, and we are uh, preparing uh, to test these things uh, in deep space. We've already done one test with, uh, with the epoxy spacecraft. We'll be doing additional ones uh, in the future. So what I hope will happen is that over time, we'll end up building, literally, mission by mission, an interplanetary backbone. As each scientific mission completes its job, it could become repurposed as a node of this interplanetary system. So that solves the problem of interplanetary networking. So the next question is, well, what else should we do? <laughs> and uh, the, the obvious thing is we need to figure out how to get to another star. So, uh, you know, next stop, Alpha Centauri. Now, what's important about this is that um, that's a little farther away than Mars. So uh, problem number one, current uh, space propulsion systems would get us to Alpha Centauri in about 65,000 years, which is a little long for a scientific experiment. It's about six times longer than our civilization has been in existence. So the likelihood that there would be anybody around 65,000 years from now to figure out what the result of the experiment uh, is might be open to some debate. So the first problem is how do we get there a little bit faster? The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which funded the ARPANET, funded the internet, funded the original architecture of the interplanetary network, funded some military tests to see if the DTN protocols would work for tactical communication, is now planning to fund a study for a spacecraft that could get to the nearest star in 100 years. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to get up to some significant fraction of the speed of light, not, you know, 20%. Okay? We're not asking for much. Uh, now, the problem is you also have to slow down, right, because otherwise you go zipping through the system and you may get two or three shots and that's it. So we have to get up to speed and then slow down, get into orbit somewhere. That's problem number one. Probably some ion-style propulsion system uh, will help us get there. Uh, some of you may be thinking, well, what about quantum communication and quantum entanglement and all that stuff? Frankly, right now, that's correlation, but not communication. So we can't rely on that. Second problem is, how in the hell are we going to signal back over 4.4 light years? And right now, my uh, favorite hobby horse, which could be wrong, is to use lasers. That's a, sort of a no-brainer. But I want the pulse of the laser to be 10 to the minus 15 seconds. I want femtosecond lasers, and the reason I want that is I want to take the power available to the laser, maybe it's 10 watts, compress it down to 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which will be one hell of a big pulse in a very brief period of time, and use that to signal back. Now the other side of the question, how the heck am I going to detect that? Well, let's see. The beam is going to spread over a 4.4 light year distance, so I can't just have one receiver in one little spot. So maybe I need to have a kind of synthetic aperture receiver that covers the solar system. Now you know why I want to build an interplanetary backbone, because I have to get receivers scattered all over the solar system in order to detect those femtosecond pulses. So that's the plan. Uh, <laughs> now all we have to do is execute. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.